The China in Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP aims to improve the quality of reporting on Africa China relations through reporting grants, workshops, and other opportunities for journalists. More information at africachinareporting.co.za and our dedicated training website at africachinatraining.com. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Network from SubChina. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, the senior China-Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, today we're going to do another one of our lightning round shows. We did that, uh, what was it, last week or the week before? I was a little apprehensive about it because I like speaking to all of the great guests that we have on the show, but we got a lot of nice email back from people saying they want more of these shows. So from time to time, we're just going to fold these type of discussions into the mix. So just the two of us today. Before we get started, I want to give a huge shout out to, again, I've talked about this on previous shows, our new Patreons at uh, patreon.com slash China Africa Project. We are launching this new community, if you're not aware. We're starting up this week, maybe this week, probably next week, definitely the week after, a new magazine-style week in review. Lots of folks have told us that the daily newsletter that we produce is a little too much. It's very, very heavy. It's very, very thick. And they said, we need a weekly digest. So we're pioneering this new weekly digest on Patreon first. So it's going to go out to all of our Patreon members first. And then later on next year, we're going to roll it out to the general public. So if you want to get this Week in Review thing that we're making, it's going to be super wicked cool. Go to patreon.com slash China Africa Project. Also want to thank Xavier, Kevin, Laurent, and Clark. Those are our new Patreons just this week, our Patreon members. Uh, we've got some uh, some happy hours scheduled with folks. Uh, you and I, Cobus, were on to have a Tusker for, for one of our Patreon members in, uh, in, in Nairobi. I'm going to have a Saigon beer. <laughs> it's uh, 12 o'clock in Nairobi when, our, when we're going to do our little happy hour, and I'll, it'll be 5 o'clock out here, so that'll be fun. But part of what we're doing with our Patreon community is holding these one-on-one -on -one briefings as well as monthly group briefings, plus we're doing a special bonus podcast every month, and we're updating with exclusive content in the Patreon community there. So once again, patreon.com slash China Africa Project. Okay, let's go to three topics this week. We're going to talk about foreign policy towards Africa from the United States, from Europe, from China. Lots of movement happening this week. And there was just a remarkable event that went down in Montpellier, France. If you weren't paying attention to the news last week, there was the France-Africa Summit. And this was unlike anything that I've ever seen before. We're going to get into that. Then we're going to talk about FOCAC, the upcoming forum on China-Africa Cooperation Summit that is scheduled to take place. We have a date, at least we think we have a date, at the end of next month. And then there was a big UK port steel, Cobus, that you were following and you wrote about this week. So we'll get to that as well. Let's start with foreign policy, because it feels to me, Cobus, like... The tectonic plates of geopolitics now related to Africa are really moving. So the United States, they are in the process now of going on to a six-month uh, strategy redo. They've brought over Judd Devermont. He is now in the National Security Council. He's going to be working on a new strategy and reformatting the U.S. strategy towards Africa that by any definition has been adrift Definitely in the Biden administration, certainly throughout the Trump administration, and really going back to the Obama administration. And I could probably take this all the way back to the George W. Bush administration, that U.S. foreign policy towards Africa has been listless. It has been uninspired. It's been shaped by China. Now, Judd Devermont is taking up the challenge in the White House. Also, uh, China is in the process of rethinking and revamping their foreign policy. We're going to be talking about that in our FOCAC segment, but let's go to France. Before we get into all of the sound bites that I want to play, talk to us a little bit about what your impressions were of what you saw from the France-Africa summit in Montpellier that went down. 
It was incredibly refreshing for me to because you know, just to give context, usually this kind of this summit, also in the French case, is between the French between French leaders and African leaders. In this case, it was Emmanuel Macron face to face with a bunch of civil society people from 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 uh, different African countries and particularly young civil society people. So it was it was, it was really refreshing. It was, it was in very kind of like no holds barred. So like. It, it, I haven't seen this kind of exchange between between an outside leader and and kind of an African constituency ever. I think this is very interesting. This was groundbreaking in many ways. It goes back to a 2017 promise that Macron made when he was in Africa, saying that he was going to reset the relationship and he was going to have this leaderless summit. That is, not a single African head of state was there. He invited eleven young African activists onto the stage. 3,000 applied to be on the stage. And I'm going to start playing you some sound bites just to give you a feeling of what happened there. Now, all of them are in French. This was not covered by the Anglophone media at all, as far as I could see, um, which is a shame because there are some really important takeaways here. I'm going to play the sound bites, though, all in French. And even if you don't speak French, that's okay. I want you to listen to the tone and remember that this is a uh, an exchange and a dialogue with the president of France on stage with 11 African youth activists in a hall of maybe a couple thousand other African youth activists the crowd was definitely on the side of the youth activists and so let's start now with Senegalese blogger and journalist Sheikh Fall and he really came out very strong with a very important message that again resonated well with the audience in the hall. Monsieur le président, ce passé est lourd et continue à peser sur nous. Je vous invite à prendre ici et maintenant des engagements forts, des décisions fortes pour reconnaître et accepter de demander pardon au continent africain. Let me translate that for you. So, Mr. President, said Sheikh, the past is heavy and it continues to this day. I invite you right here, right now, to resolutely apologize to the African continent. My goodness. I mean, the president, once again, he refused to apologize. And instead, he said he wants to reintroduce France to Africa with what he called a new beginning. He said he wants the politics of what he said in French, reconnaissance, which is to get to know each other again. And to say that that went down poorly uh, is an understatement. But Cobus, that theme of apology has been a constant throughout Macron's administration and his time in office because he's gone to Algeria, he's gone to other African countries, and he's acknowledged the horrors of colonialism, but he's had a difficulty actually apologizing for it, saying, I'm sorry, much the same way that in the United States, there has been no apology for slavery. I mean, really, South Africa is the best example with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that you had, but that in many ways stands apart in history. And so this burden of the past really seems to continue to haunt French-Africa relations. It really does, um, and rightly so. I mean, you know, the, the the French did terrible things in Africa, um, and they weren't the only ones. I think uh, you know this is. Uh, I, I'm fascinated by this issue. I'm fascinated by this this decision to to because he himself have have referred to to the crimes quote unquote of of French colonialism. You know, so it's their crimes, but they're not to be apologized for. Um, you know, so so that that kind of that kind of line he's walking is. Is fascinating for me. It clearly has a lot to do with with domestic politics within France, um, and you know. But but I think that is the point. You know, kind of is because you know, I, I, and we we're seeing this very strongly in in uh, in the UK as well. Is that you know th- there was a fascinating article in the New Yorker uh, a little while ago about about um, British country houses, um, these kind of massive like Downton Abbey style kind of like huge huge kind of mansions, um, and they. And the kind of tourist, the tourism industry, you know, kind of, of of normal Britons kind of going and visiting them. And a, a lot of these massive kind of properties and estates, okay, like they were funded by slavery money, right? Kind of like the, a lot of them were like had sugar plantations, these people 
people have sugar plantations in Jamaica, in the Bahamas, and you know, so, so these these they are emanations from not only British colonialism but from slavery particularly, and a, a lot of that is actually reflected in the in the design in these houses. So you have a lot of a lot of kind of like big, like in some cases even like pictures of of literal in, in, in chains, like people in chains, for example, in, in you know as as a, as a little reminder, you know, of of, of the hardworking people in Jamaica, um, and so um, you know so and and then the kind of refusal from contemporary Brit Britons um, to think of, a, of of their legacy as anything but positive, you know? So that, that refusal to, to make that kind of mental leap into, oh, this was actually a crime. Um, and I, I'm, I'm sure that that is at play in, you know, kind of in, in France and certainly at play in, in perpetrator countries like Belgium, for example. You know, so, so, um, so you know, I, I think that watching him kind of like doing that kind of gymnastics was fascinating. Yeah, and that's not just an issue in Europe and Africa, but out here in Asia, again, between Japan and the victims of World War II. Yes, and the Japanese, much. too, have a very difficult way of saying, I'm sorry. They have expressed regret. They've expressed remorse. They've expressed, you know, disappointment. I mean, all the different ways that the Japanese have been able to say everything except the words, we're sorry. And that's what is really holding back history in many respects. So, again, very interesting to see how the past continues to haunt the president. Let's continue with some of the discussions. Let's go on to Malian activist Adam Diko. And uh, boy, she was really direct. Arrêtez ces discours paternalistes, dire que nous allons vous aider, nous allons... Non, nous n'avons pas besoin d'aide, nous avons besoin de coopération, nous avons besoin de partenariats, et nous sommes liés par l'histoire, mais nous sommes liés par les dangers, nous sommes liés par les défis. My goodness, can you hear the tone and the passion in her voice there? I mean, remember, yeah, she's talking to the French president, a head of state, fearless. I mean, it was just fearless. I got chills watching her. Now, listen to, oh, let me, okay, first let me translate. And, and she said, stop with all this paternalistic talk, telling us you're going to help us. No, we don't need cooperation and partners. We're connected by history. And she really went on about this idea, and this is something we've heard for years, really since you and I began this podcast, how so many in Africa resent this aid and dependency culture that comes out of the United States and Europe. Let's listen then to the response from Macron. Mais je suis 100% d'accord avec ce que vous venez de dire. Mais après, vous pouvez pas me dire on doit avoir un dialogue équilibré réciproque et me dire dès que je vous parle avec le cœur et que je vous dis la vérité, je serai paternaliste. Je suis pas paternaliste, je suis sincère. I agree with you 100%, he said, with what you're saying. But you can't tell me that we need to have a dialogue. And the minute that I say something, you then accuse me of being paternalistic. I'm not being paternalistic here. I'm being sincere. So again, and it's wonderful to, to hear this done in French because you can hear how animated people get. But you feel that tension, Cobus, that exists. And, and really, French engagement in Africa is going to be haunted by this until there is a massive break with the past and it doesn't look like French politics will allow for that because, as you pointed out, the pressure that he's getting from the far right, who is resurgent in, in France in many respects, uh, will, will block that. But this idea of paternalism was a theme of the discussion in Montpellier. Yes, and, and, and it, it really raises then very interesting questions around around the, the role of China. You know, because, because you know, even as, as this is happening, I remember, you know, a, a year or two ago, we, we had a, a, an interview with a, with a Senegalese academic, who I'm now actually blanking on his name, apologies. Um, and, uh, you know, kind of, an, and, and he made the point that, that for so long, West Africa, like France was West Africa's largest trading partner. And now for a country like Senegal, it's sitting at like number 13 um, and you know and, and, and the, the trade investment everything is kind of like pivoted to, to China um, you know and then the question of what what constitutes paternalism in this relationship then becomes a very kind of interesting one, you know, kind of because not only from from the French side, but but also from you know when when one looks at it, at the kind of wider issue of of the tendency of of the Chinese to really just really only focus on on elites, you know, to, that that they were not particularly interested in engaging, you know, on you know on, with with civil society, not nearly on this level. Can you imagine, um, you know? Yeah. So so you know so so it it then it it it, it one of the really important issues I think that that all of this that this event really raised is that 
these spaces delineate these very hard delineated spaces within which there is within which these countries like France, for example, f f you know they're, they're okay to to engage with Africa within certain very specific terms. The moment the the interaction moves beyond those terms, it kind of falls off the table. You know, there's and and so so within the with, within the international system, there are these kind of like spaces within that that are, that are seen as kind of African spaces, like aid, for example, and then other spaces where Africa just can't get in um, you know and, um, and and that kind of structural exclusion I think underlies so much of, of the anger from, from some of these civil society people. So let me just delay our discussion about China because this will be a you know a nice segue into our discussion on FOCAC what lessons China should take from what happened in Montpellier but let me just do our final soundbite here and this final soundbite I really think we should draw the attention of the US because Really, when we talk about the core of U.S. engagement in Africa today, the things that come up are programs like PEPFAR, which is the Presidential Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. It's things like the Malaria Plan. It's these development projects. That is the backbone of American engagement strategy in Africa. And so when we talk about the accomplishments of the United States, it comes down to things being done by Samantha Power and the team at USAID. Now, keep that in mind when Elda Kuama from Burkina Faso, and uh, this was her comment. And she, by far, if you're going to watch the, the whole two-hour-long event, Elda was just incredible. Ça fait près d'un siècle que l'aide au développement se balade en Afrique. Ça ne marche pas. It has been almost a century since we've had, and she used air quotes here, development aid in Africa. It doesn't work. I mean, she went on for probably 25 minutes and just the confidence, and she just took it to the president. But this idea that development aid doesn't work, and it goes back now to the origins of China's engagement in Africa, because African leaders told the Chinese from the beginning, we don't want aid. And that in many ways is the same sentiments we're hearing in Montpellier that we don't want your charity, we want business, we want trade, and we want to be treated as equals. Now, there's a dark side to that, because with that comes collateral, debt, loans. It's not charity anymore. The bank wants to be paid back. But clearly you're hearing this amazing frustration from young people. And I just thought this idea, this condemnation of development aid to me was very important. Yeah, it, you know, kind of you. You mentioned PEPFAR and so on. Um, you know, those are still concrete programs with real deliverables, right? Where I think we're, they're, they're fantastic, yeah, and amazing. They're like, fantastic. You know, but, of, if, but if that's the only thing you've got, that's not going to be enough. What, what I think you, this raises a lot of questions around is is both the the both Europe, the the UK, and and America's insistence on on things like civil society promotion for example um which again you know kind of as someone who works in a civil society space i have a lot of a lot of respect for but at the same time i th you know kind of i think many many people have shown that that you know kind of simply simply fixating on on issues like for example formal democracy you know, isn't sufficient to actually making sure that the spaces you support are actually democratic. And because so much of, of, of democracy also depends on people feeling empowered on a daily basis to live their lives, you know. So, so the kind of developmental impacts that Chinese infrastructure has is... They're really significant, and and to to pretend like like I think a lot of a lot of Western donor nations do that you don't need roads or you know you you know they don't need to fund things like these kind of hard hard infrastructure things in you know and and it's fine to simply kind of simply leap ahead and you know like in in the in the old parlance they they don't fund hard hardware they fund software right um, so to, but to, there's a there's a, an illusion there that that simply by 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 supporting civil society, for example, you will actually then have functional civil society, which I think in many in many African countries have disproven that that assumption, you know, and and particularly the assumption that 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 kind of just simply opening these these kind of democratic spaces without dealing without also jumping into the the issue of the material conditions within there within which they they take place that you will then boost development just simply by supporting those institutions. 
it's not true you know like it, it, it hasn't worked um and um and, and i think you know that again you know, it's really important for these people to actually to to raise that issue so let's now transition our discussion towards the chinese and what lessons do you think that the chinese should take away from the summit in montpellier and the big takeaway for me is that the voices of these young people of sheikh fall of adam Diko, of el dakwama are going to be entirely absent from FOCAC. In fact, they've never been a part of the China-Africa discourse because China wants to control all of the engagements. And it's inconceivable on, I don't know, some third planet twice removed from Mars that you would ever have an opportunity for an unscripted engagement on live television with the Chinese president. I mean, that would absolutely never happen. By the way, we haven't seen this with the American president either, so let's just be fair here. But if you were to advise the Chinese government and say there are some lessons out of what came from Montpellier, both in terms of the style, the format, and the substance of the conversation, what would you say to the Chinese who are organizing FOCAC? I think I'd probably say that that try to engage with civil society, um, you know, because anything you're planning for Africa, civil society is involved already, um, whether you like them or to be involved or not. Um, you know, they, they like, in, in such a kind of a young continent, I think, you know, Africa is, is incredibly is incredibly dynamic, um, and 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 some of some of its dynamism is in this kind of civil society. Those are the people one one wants on board, um, because you know, kind of because it's not enough to simply have leaders on board because the leaders are frequently so so kind of removed from from the actual population. Um, yeah, you know, kind of it's, it's it's a basic thing, but but it's really important. So number one, I. 100% agree with what you're saying, to engage civil society, even if you're not doing it publicly, because it makes the Chinese queasy to have these kinds of things done publicly, find ways to invite them privately. Even doing what, remember a couple years ago, when Wu Peng was the ambassador at the embassy in Kenya, and he brought decolonize to the embassy and had a photo with them exactly, and had that engagement. Yeah. I would encourage more Chinese ambassadors on the continent to do those types of things. And that would, again, that would help to diffuse some of the tensions that we're seeing right now in in civil society and narrow this huge gap in this perception out there that Chinese engagement in Africa is a sport among the elites and that Chinese actors are engaging with just colluding with is the word that often people use with African governing elites. Okay, let's talk about FOCAC. Nobody knows the official date. The Chinese have not actually come out publicly and stated the date, nor have the Senegalese. But we have some reliable sources who have told us that it's going to be on Sunday, November 28th, and Monday, November 29th. I put a giant asterisk next to those dates because we know that the people telling us are reliable, but we have no way to verify it. So that's the best information that we have. We heard that it was going to be in the second or maybe the first week of December. But now the dates that we've gotten from our sources tell us November 28 and November 29. It's just still kind of weird to me, Cobus, why this is such a state secret. I mean, I, I just, I've never understood why they make everybody go through these shenanigans. I mean, it makes it difficult to cover it. It makes it difficult for people to organize around it. I mean, do you have any insight from your experience as to why they make the date secret up until the last minute? I think you kind of answered your question. It makes it difficult to cover. It makes it difficult to plan for. It makes it difficult for anyone to organize around. <laughs> so stupid. I mean, it's really just the dumbest thing in this day and age that they continue to do. But okay, we'll get past that. Coming up at this FOCAC, it's likely going to be a very different FOCAC than in previous years. The central question is, is China going to bring its massive checkbook to the table? Is it going to do what it's done in the past, where it went from $20 billion to $60 billion to $60 billion again in 2018? Will it come out with this big number? When, in fact, the Russians did a summit uh, with Africa, no number. TCAD in Japan, no number. The UK Investment, uh, I think it was UK Investment Summit or something like that, no number. The French, when they have these summits, no numbers. So it's really common now 
that when Africa gets together with major partners, that they don't walk away with this big, giant number. China stands alone in doing this. So there's a part of me that says this is the chance for China to finally say, enough, we're not going to give a number. We're just going to make some promises on all the different commitments we're going to do, but there's not going to be a number. However, I doubt they're going to do that (laughs) because just last month at the China Africa Economic and Trade Expo in Changsha, Hunan province, what did they do at the end of the summit? They came out with this big number, $22.9 billion in deals signed. So the Chinese love their numbers, and I'm not sure they're going to be able to get away from it. I think that was always the thing that distinguished FOCAC from from all these other summits, you know, is, is, is the fact that there is such a big number. For me, actually, the issue is, the issue, obviously, like whether there's a number or not is very interesting. It's, it's always, it'll be, you know, whether it's the same number, higher, lower, or no number, like the, any of those options will be notable. Um, but I think what, what's what's really notable at this particular moment will be what will be the breakdown of, of whatever financing is, is offered into which kind of, I mean, what I mean is how will it break down into different kinds of financing instruments? Um, because... We're at this inflamed moment around debt, Chinese debt, particularly in in Africa. Um, So simply announcing, okay, we're throwing another several billion dollars of debt at you. Um, On the one hand, great, because financing, you know, but on the other hand, like, you know, it immediately raises so many other questions. So one of the things I'll be looking out for is, are we seeing, for example, an increase in grants? Um, or are we? Are, is there any talk of any kind of like new financing instrument? You know, like are, like who who are the particular kind of the, the the particular financiers involved? You know, or whether any of them will whether any of that will get broken down in detail? All of those, you know, I think will be really revealing. So some of the new emphasis that we're hearing, and again, this is all rumor and speculation, so please don't quote us on any of this stuff. Nobody really knows for sure. I'm sure there's probably some people who know for sure. We certainly don't. But we're hearing kind of conversations and chatter around from people who are involved in the talks that there's going to be a bigger emphasis on private sector engagement. One of the pieces of feedback that we got was that the African delegations in Beijing who were negotiating the agenda were a little bit pissed off that... The number one, that the agenda was being set too much by the Chinese side and they were pushing back on that. Number two, there was some frustration that all of the money that was being allocated for private sector engagement was being devoted to Chinese companies and not enough being devoted to the African side. So that was one of the areas of contention that we heard about. Again, people who have knowledge of this will probably know a lot more. Uh, Let's go through very quickly five of the themes that I think are going to dominate, instead of the big infrastructure projects, like I don't foresee that there's going to be a big railway announcement or there's going to be a big new highway announcement worth billions and billions of dollars as there was in the past. In part because, let me take you back to 2018, Kobus, when you and I were covering FOCAC from Beijing and I was actually living in China at the time. When they came out with that 60 billion number, they had to censor it in China. Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> it's very interesting. People were pissed off. I remember I was taking a taxi in Shanghai and this guy was saying to me, I can't believe that we're giving all this money to Africa. This is crazy. Now, that was 2018, back when the economy was doing way better than it is today. So I think it's a sensitive political issue at home that if they come out with a big number, there are a lot of people who are going to wonder saying, is that really the smartest thing to do, given the fact that the domestic economy is sucking wind in many respects? After all, we're living in the era of Evergrande right now, the largest potential collapse in the history of corporations. Three, four hundred billion dollars is what we know right now. And the idea that Chinese taxpayers are going to pick up that tab. So I'm not so sure they're going to come out with a big number only because it may cause problems at home, too. OK, With that in mind, let's put the number aside for now. Let's look at the five key themes. And I think you're on board with me on this, okay? Number one, infrastructure. I suspect they're going to be talking a lot about infrastructure, but it's going to be infrastructure that is smaller, that is more economically viable, that is in the tens of millions, maybe low hundreds of millions of dollars in terms of financing. And it might be more in the public-private partnership realm, like we're seeing in the Nairobi Expressway, rather than an outright grant from 
the China Exim Bank or the China Development Bank. What say you about infrastructure? Yes, I, I think there's no way that infrastructure is not going to be on the on the agenda, among others, because of African pressure. Um, and then it'll be very interesting to see how they kind of innovate in this space, um, because I think there is space for innovation, and it'll be very interesting. A again, like you know, kind of what the kind of the, the spread of different kind of lenders are, and and I, I agree with you. I think there's a lot of there's it, it, time is ripe. I think for a lot of private sector involvement but then also how the, the particular kinds of infrastructure breaks down um, and whether there's actually a, a, a move towards a more innovative thinking about which kind of infrastructure is needed for example do we need big grids or do we need microgrids for example you know there's, there's, there's lots of different ways of building infrastructure with lots of different outcomes so um, yeah so, so I, I agree with you I think it, it's, it's not going to go away so the next one is health and this one would seem like a no-brainer, but we're, again, we're picking up on some of these themes. Just in the past week, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi has held calls with his counterparts in Kenya and Chile and a number of other countries. And one of the consistent themes in all of the calls is China's continued support in providing vaccines, in PPE, and what they call the development of the health belt and road. So uh, talk to us a little bit about what you see happening in the health sector, both in terms of obviously vaccines and COVID, but maybe in other areas as well. One of the interesting things that kind of well, that struck me um, is, uh, you know, I, I was speaking to to a, a colleague who um, who's very interested in in vaccine diplomacy, um, and and we c kind of jointly came to came to the conclusion that that there is a real actual split i think between what we what we saw on mask diplomacy in the early part of the pandemic and what then turned into vaccine diplomacy later you know the 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 role out of, of the, the the kind of optics of the kind of massive planes of of protective equipment arriving and being rolled out to all african countries stood really in contrast with with how the vaccines were rolled out like i think everyone expected and i think the the europeans the Americans were really fearing that the Chinese are just going to roll out vaccines everywhere in the global south. And they did it, right? Like, like in... in in, in Africa, like it, it only came to a, like Africa is way down on the list compared to other other parts of the global south. And within Africa, there's no equal distribution. You know, kind of some countries got a ton of Chinese vaccines and others got none. Um, so you know, so so it's so I kind of expect some, if, if there is a number, I expect a vaccine number actually at Foca. Like the, the, there's some kind of going to be some announcement of like a huge like Sinopharm consignment. But um, you know, it, it certainly seems that the, 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 that the, the that there's a great space to step in there because everyone else is falling down on the job. I suspect that the Chinese are going to do a lot of talking about vaccines, but let's really be very clear that the Chinese have been extraordinarily cheap on vaccines in Africa. They have a good narrative, but they have been as miserly as you're going to get. 76.1 million vaccines have been distributed across the continent to date, the bulk of those going to about six countries uh, in terms of donations, only 14.91 million. Now, remember, these are two-shot vaccines. So when we talk about donations of 14.91 million, that's only 7.5 million people who are vaccinated out of a continent of 1.2 billion. So we're talking tens of millions of people. China, in contrast, just to show you where their priorities are, here in Asia Pacific, almost 600 million have been distributed to date. And almost and 60 million have been donated. So still not a whole lot on the donation side. One very important thing to remember is that when we look at U.S. donations of vaccines, and the Chinese have been doing this from the podium in Beijing at the foreign ministry, comparing American donations to Chinese vaccine distributions. Yeah, not the same thing. <laughs> It's not the same thing here because no one's tracking all of the Moderna and the Pfizer sales. The only available data that we have is the State Department website that tracks the donations that the United States is channeling through uh, COVAX. And it's a pretty low number. So I think it's, uh, let me just quickly pull that up for you right here. It is, it's a very low number. So the United States is not doing itself a service by not having a kind of cumulative number that it can able to do. So right now to date, the United States has shipped 186 million vaccines uh, around the world. In here in Africa, they've done 42.1 million. But again, that is just donations. They've committed half a billion through COVAX, 
but 42 million. And again, that's an absurdly small number too. It, it's just, it's shocking to me. I mean, all of this. So the Chinese, I think, are going to talk a great game on vaccines, but unless they're really going to ramp up big, I don't know. The news came out this week, by the way, on vaccines, something very important. An expert panel at the World Health Organization suggested that people 60 or older who've taken Sinovac or Sinopharm should receive a third booster shot. And one of the things that I wrote this week was the fact that that may further complicate the distribution of vaccines in Africa, because although Africa is a very young continent, it's going to put more pressure on supply. So if you're starting to take booster shots in some parts of the world, that means there's fewer shots available in places like Africa. Also, it might encourage more reinfections or infections if people are not protected after a year, particularly older people 60 or over. So vaccines is going to be something. Let's see if something big comes out of it. I am a little bit suspicious on that. Okay, next big category, digital. This is going to be a huge one, I think. So they've talked about the digital Silk Road. By the way, we're going to have Jonathan Hillman from CSIS on the show later in November. We have to read his new book on the digital Silk Road. So I'm looking forward to that. But I think technology is going to be a very big one in terms of building new smart city infrastructure, data center infrastructure, 5G, even talking about 6G, bolstering 3G. All of this is going to be a very prominent theme. It's an area that China has an absolute advantage over almost everybody in Africa. What do you think on the digital track? I agree with you. I think it's going to be huge. The um, because you know, realistically speaking, it's win win win. The, the third win being like it's both the Chinese government wins, Chinese companies win, Africa wins. Like you know, or at least that's you know, kind of that will be the narrative. And um, and I think it's it's a, it's actually in some kind of ways kind of a realistic narrative because the thing is what we've seen from Western countries is just a, a lot of willingness to kind of to try and lean on global south governments taking chinese chinese technology but no real attempt no co no coherent attempt to 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 try and kind of provide an alternative so that's a losing proposition right you you're essentially just telling people well just just stay undeveloped then we we prefer you this way um you know so um this, you know so so in, in that sense i think there's 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 not going to be any any pushback i think I, you know i i expect lots of smart city projects and so on to be announced now adjacent to the technology track is going to be the green track and so we've heard so much about the green belt and road there's been a lot of talk about china's coal decision that xi jinping made at the united nations general assembly a couple of weeks ago and the decision to halt all funding and construction of coal projects in in africa and around the world uh, I think there's going to be a lot of talk about green infrastructure, so from transportation and the, the sale of electric vehicles. We did a story on that today about a fantastic startup called Solar Taxi in Ghana that uses BYD, Cherry, and other Chinese cars, Chinese solar panels, solar farms, hydroelectric, all of this in terms of reducing emissions that the Chinese are going to be putting money into. Talk to us about what you think is going to happen in the green space. I also think that this this is going to be big. It's going to be interesting to see exactly how it's laid out, and particularly the the at issue is, is is the point that you made before: is what's going to happen to all of this coal, pro, all of these coal projects that were already signed off on before Xi Jinping's announcement that they're going to start building coal. So you know, we, we already saw some of the some of the the private Chinese banks bailing on it, um, particularly ICBC, um, you know, kind of stepping away from Sengwa um, coal plant in Zimbabwe. Um, and you know, so so, but it'll be interesting to see whether there's any gesture in terms of replacing it with something, um, and then the 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 kind of particular the the particular kind of um, you know technologies that are announced would be interesting. Like, I really hope it's not a lot of hydro, um, because hydro doesn't increasingly doesn't work in Africa. Like climate change is is throwing hydro out the window, you know, because it was because um because of recurring droughts. So but it might be something interesting like 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 in this uh, uh, initiative that we discussed before where they add solar capacity to already to already kind of existing hydro projects. So you know it'll I think there's a real space there for you know kind of for a movement forward and for China to step into I think we a role that 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 it already occupies which is 
it really is a leader in in in, in sustainable power technology around the world, um, and it can just as well own that and, and really go with it. You know, so and and Africa is a place to do that. So I really hope there's action there. The last of the main tracks that I expect at FOCAC 8, and of course there are going to be a lot of other discussions going on on security, on partnerships in media, journalism, all these different things, but the big ones I think are the ones we've addressed, and the last one is agriculture. And agriculture has always been a part of FOCAC from the beginning, but it hasn't really been a main theme, and I think this year it's going to be elevated much higher. One of the reasons I say that is because we've just seen over the past year an escalation and elevation of the discourse around agriculture in the China-Africa relationship. At the trade expo in Changsha, agriculture was really important. Agricultural technology being sold from China into Africa, opening up the China market to African exporters, helping African countries narrow their food deficits. Uh, Those have been all prominent themes over the past six, nine, 12 months. So I expect agriculture to also be a very big theme. Maybe some big announcements coming from the Chinese side on taking down, say, some import barriers on certain African agricultural products. That's always been one of their favorite announcements. So soybeans from Tanzania, chili peppers from Rwanda, coffee from Uganda. These have all been previous announcements that have gotten a lot of attention in China. And I would expect them maybe to bring that up also in Focac. Yeah, I, I also think so. It's it's another it's another one of these spaces that's kind of like win 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 in all directions. Um, it's also it, it 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 plays well in if you know if, if you're interested in kind of sticking it to the West, then this is also a space to do that because because you know uh, a lot of like one of the all the the most kind of consistent complaints in among African kind of agricultural people is the 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 how African, uh, you know, kind of products are kind of kept out of European and American markets because of subsidies. So, um, like agricultural, domestic agricultural subsidies. So it's, um, you know, so, so, so it, again, it, it plays very well to the crowd. Um, and I think, I think agricultural development is, is a very legit kind of field for Africa to move into. I think it, you know, it makes a lot of sense for, for many African countries. I mean, you talk about the agricultural subsidies and the agricultural lobbies in the United States and Europe. They are among the most powerful. So try selling a banana from Angola in the United States and Europe, and it's extraordinarily difficult. So this is one of the areas where China has a real need because it needs to import an extraordinary amount of food. The problem is, as we've mentioned in the past, there's a big misconception in, in, in many parts of Africa that Africa will eventually become a major food provider to China. I don't think that's ever going to happen. China's demand for food is so large that it needs the industrial scale agriculture from Europe, Brazil, and the United States. Africa does not have that. What these agricultural deals can do is to help boost African employment. They can help narrow the trade deficits a little bit. This is in many ways more for Africa's benefit than for China's benefit, in my view. So those are the five tracks that we kind of see. This is what we've been forecasting in our newsletter and on our website. Again, I am very humble to this. I've been covering this story for more than a decade now. It may be 100% right. It may be none of it right. No one really knows. We have not seen a peek at the agenda. These are just our best guesses as to what we think will be on the agenda. But we do want to share with you what we learn. This is one reason why, again, you should sign up to the China Africa Project. If you are following FOCAC and you want to find out what's going on, we're sharing as much as we have with you and much as we can as what we're permitted to do. So that's one of the benefits of, of being a part of our community. Kobus. Last topic we're going to talk about today is this huge UK deal in uh, in Africa for ports. A lot of people put it into a China context. The British said, uh-uh, this has nothing to do with China. This is about British development. You wrote about it this week. You thought it was very important. Tell us about this billion-dollar port deal. The, it, this is it's very interesting. It's it's for, by the CDC Group, which is which is the the UK government's kind of foreign in, for development investment arm, um, and it's it's uh, three hundred twenty million going three hundred twenty million dollars going into three ports, one in like one in Senegal, um, one in Egypt uh, on the on the Red Sea side, and then one in Somaliland, the self declared um, kind of independent territory. 
Um, and then another 400 million kind of going into into further logistics and possible dry ports and so on. What was very interesting for me is that they, they're preparing up with Dubai Ports World, which is obviously a very big ports developer. It has several projects, uh, um, you know, on, on the eastern seaboard in Africa. They're also, um, Dubai Ports World, you know, has was famously kind of kicked out of Djibouti, um, you know, in favor of, of China Merchant Ports Holdings. Um, so you know the idea that it doesn't have to do with China, it clearly has to do with China. <laughs> you know the no, but just be careful about reading too much into the tension between Dubai Ports World and China, because at the end of the day, Dubai Ports World is a state-owned company of the United Arab Emirates, and the United Arab Emirates has a very close relationship with China. So in this particular case in Djibouti, yes, it was bad. They got into big legal fights and court battles, but I'm not entirely sure that. UAE, DPW, and China are at odds with each other beyond that. No, that that's not that's also not what what how I see it. Um, I think I, th- I think it it has more to do with with I think that this kind of corporate cons- corporate considerations involved or like profit considerations involved. So so it's clearly you know the, if setting up a port in Somaliland you know kind of takes a chunk out of the business that's done in Djibouti. You know so so it, one doesn't have to have a, a feud with China to you know kind of to still be smarting from losing the business that that, that Dubai Ports World had in Djibouti. Um, for me, more that I don't think the the, the 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 fixation on China or the focus on China, I think, doesn't particularly lie necessarily on the Dubai or the, the Arab United Arab Emirates side. It lies more, I think, on the British side, um, and particularly not not the, the UK itself, but it, but the this kind of investment, the strategic investment in this competitor port. Because keep in mind the the, the Chinese port in in Djibouti is a is a dual purpose port, which is also so so it's, it it can also encompass uh, military vessels so um so I, I you know i don't particularly think necessarily that that this was kind of planned or plotted you know i think it just aligns with priorities and one of the priorities that it aligns with is to try and kind of like d- decrease djibouti's importance as as a regional hub um because of the chinese presence there that was my reading out did you think that that makes sense it does I'm just not sure. And again, I speak with not a whole lot of knowledge on this, but the one part that I was a little bit disappointed about when I saw that it was a port deal was because one of the things that we've been covering, especially on the eastern shore of Africa, is there's a glut of ports right now. So starting in Djibouti, going down to Somaliland, uh, going down to Mombasa, then we have the new port of Lamu, which is just came online in Tanzania, the ports of Dar es Salaam and Bagamayo, and then, of course, the mega port in southern Africa at the port of Durban. And I just thought to myself, do we really need more ports? Is that the most pressing infrastructure need right now in Africa? I just, you know, $300 million could go a long way at building road infrastructure, power infrastructure, digital infrastructure, things that are really, really urgent right now. And yet there's a lot of money flowing into ports and there's been a lot of money flowing into ports. So maybe maybe they see something that I don't know, but I just, I thought to myself, again, more ports, really? And I'm just wondering if this is one of those things that's helping the British more than it's helping Africa. And that's a little bit weird because if it was Dubai Ports World, which is a purely for-profit entity, that makes sense. But because this is coming out of a development agency, I thought, "Mm, that's a little weird. (laughs) Yes. Um, But, you know, as as the point that I made is that the CDC group originally, that name stands for Colonial Development Corporation, which they've now kind of Um, (laughs) rebranded. They now, they call themselves, officially on their website, they call themselves the world's first development financing agency. I'm like, yes, that's one way of calling it. I mean, let's go back to the beginning of the show and the apologies, but boy, talk about being tone deaf. Yeah, I mean, this was... Holy Moses, I did not know that. I did not know that. My... You know, so 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 I think, yeah, I hundred percent think it, it it favors the British British concerns more than African concerns. <sighs> um, right. I mean, you know, on the one hand, I, I can imagine Africans saying like, look, you know, Africa Africa wants to trade. 
and it is a, essentially a massive island. So you know, kind of, so it needs ports in order to trade, and and it's it, there, there's a, there's a logic there a little bit that I don't know if you saw there was this week there was a this kind of meme going around. Someone so there's this graphic designer made um, made these kind of maps saying a, a, a normal in any European city, any Asian city, any American city. So it's like these kind of features of these cities, you know, kind of just boil down to essentially you know kind of a, like one map and one of the features on the Asian one was a, a subway station in the middle of an open field um, and that was so funny for me, it is so true um, about how Asian development works but there's, a, there's an aspect there <laughs> I think that makes sense here too is in the sense of you might not need the ports right now but in 20 years maybe you know, Africa will have like moved up into becoming a, a much more of a trading kind of global trader, and in which case you would need them then. You know, so it would be convenient to have them. Um, so you know, it, it clearly is very, very focused, more focused on external trade and exter like exporting stuff out or importing stuff in rather than creating linkages within the continent, which arguably would have been more useful. Um, but still, you know, a port is a port. You know, it, it may well be useful. I guess so. But, it, you know, the focus right now, to me, should be on bolstering the AFCFTA. That's the African Continental Free Trade Area. Because the idea is that intra-African trade is, from what everybody tells us and what everybody says, is an absolute freaking nightmare. Yes. Crossing borders, the logistics, all of it. And so shipping stuff to China out of the port of Durban, they've got that down pretty well. I think it's the N3 highway or N4 highway that goes from... N3. That's a beautiful highway from what everybody says. So the logistics of getting stuff out of Africa, they've been doing that well for, what, four, 500 years? This moving things around within Africa should be the priority. And so when announcements like this coming out of the CDC... Now, again, I'm happy that they're doing a lot of money into dry ports and things like that. But how do you facilitate intra-Africa trade? That, to me, is where the money is needed. So if people are looking for development ideas, yes, Britain, yes, US, yes, France, the facilitating of intra-Africa trade seems to be where you can do a lot of good. And by the way, just to motivate our friends in the US and Europe, it's one of the topics of discussion that's been going on in Chinese think tank land is how do you bolt the AFCFTA onto the Belt and Road? And so the Chinese are actually thinking about enhancing trade within Africa to facilitate, again, as we've talked about in the context of the British, making it easier to trade externally as well. But they are already thinking about this intra-Africa trade. So you say the word China and Washington and everything gets funded. So maybe that will be the thing that uh, helps, helps get a project funded for intra-Africa trade. So let's wrap up our discussion. What's your big picture out of what we've talked about in terms of France, summits, the trade, the CDC, What's your takeaway from this week? You know, I, I guess I guess my my kind of bigger my biggest takeaway is that Africa will have to Africa. I think is you you said at the at the beginning that that the 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 different kind of continental plates are aligning that they that they kind of there's you know that that all of these external actors are, are redefining. Or, or in 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 limited ways, I think redefining their the engagement with Africa. I think. Africa will have to redefine its engagement with these external actors. And it needs to, and, and in, in the process, it needs to redefine its position in the world um, in preparation for actually changing the way that the, deal, that the world deals with Africa. It first has to change the way that it thinks about itself in the world. Um, and I think these, the civil society activists that, that we, that we um, listen to um, in, in the French segment, I think th those are the kind of people doing that work. Um, but there's a much more of it needed. Um, because, you know, the... the the what we know is that that these these kind of spaces like development for example these kind of siloed spaces which are spaces to only deal with africa and then the moment you're dealing with a wider range of, of actors and suddenly africa falls off the table that tendency is like that because it's a kind of a comfort zone for people it's a it's a it's a comfort zone particularly for for kind of global powers um because they don't want to deal with africa they don't want to they, <laughs> they don't want to have to like change their agricultural terms or they don't want to pick fights with the agriculture cultural lobbies or doing any of these things. They're very comfortable with Africa being underdeveloped. They're happy with that. You know, like it works for them. Um, it doesn't work for Africa. 
So the so the 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 onus lies on Africa to you know to to force a redefinition of its own position in the world. Um, you know, and um, and uh, the I think there's a lot of work to be done there within the continent and in, in thinking out what exactly that means. Um, and I think we we saw we seeing kind of glimpses, you know, of of, of what that would look like. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a lot of work to do. Okay, let's leave our conversation there. So much to talk about this week. Again, this has just been a summary of what we talk about in in great detail in our newsletter and on our website. So if a subscription will help you to better understand these issues, go to chinaafricaproject.com slash subscribe. It's just $75 for students and teachers and $149 a year for everybody else. For those of you who just want a more casual engagement, we've got this fantastic Patreon community, as I mentioned at the top. We're doing happy hours on Zoom. We're doing a new Week in Review, which is coming out. We've got these great chats that are that are being lined up. We're posting into the community uh, three to four times a week. There's It's just a lot of cool stuff that's going on. People are really nice. I'm super excited. It just makes me so happy that this is happening. So we'd love for you to be a part of that community. Once again, patreon.com slash China Africa Project. So that'll do it for this edition of the show. We've got some great guests lined up for next week. So we'll be back to our normal format, but we do like doing these little lightning round shows every once in a while. So until next week, for Cobus van Staden, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. Or follow the guys on Twitter. Eric's at Iolanda, and you can find Cobus at Stadenesk. For more information about the China Africa Project, and to sign up for our free weekly email news brief, go to chinaafricaproject.com. <laughs>